Hello. Recently, my mind has been laden with the zany, magical, otherworldly, fascinating assortment of thoughts brought about by playing Super Mario Bros. 2. It is currently 2019. This game is 31 years old. A quick Google search for Super Mario Bros. 2 yields about 118 million results. There have been more words devoted, more sentences articulated, more phonic sonitudes sung than any one person may absorb. I ventured once, twice, thrice, but four times into Subcon, playing in order the NES original, the Nintendo Switch NES online re-release, the Super Mario All-Stars compilation, and the Game Boy Advance remake. On that authority, I'm going to call this the self-proclaimed Super Mario Bros. 2, aka Super Mario Bros. USA expert Jason Graves' comprehensive video survey of Super Mario Bros. 2. It's no secret by now, you already know the story. Despite what knowledge you may or may not retain, make no mistake, this is as super and as real as any other Mario diversion. It is from the same philosophical kingdom, another interpretation of Super Mario 1's genius. You replace the Italian-American stereotypes with Middle Eastern West Asian ones. Instead of turtles and Venus flytraps, there are snakes and lumbering cacti. Instead of pressing down to venture inside a pipe, a vase does one and the same. Instead of finding clever warps hidden up in the scoreboard, you find them in cleverly telegraphed locations with a magic potion. Look at those mushrooms. Look at those Koopa shells. Look at those POW blocks. Super Mario Bros. 2 is Miyamoto's team using core Mario concepts intertwined amidst a new central gimmick. When you get hit, you still shrink. Listen to this Mario theme and tell me that this isn't a real Mario game. Super Mario Bros. 2 is what happens when you get a cold and your voice sounds raspy and cooler than normal. It's what happens when Donkey Kong Jr. shapes entire portions of your video game. Its present day existence is that of one game masquerading as another, and it's perchance a tad coincidental that this game is obsessed with masks. As a matter of fact, if you don't count endlessly spawning enemies, there are literally 303 masks in this game. Yes, I counted. Shy guys wear masks because they are shy. Super Mario Bros. 2 wears a mask because Americans in 1986 were too slow-minded for that certain other Mario game. Super Mario Bros. 2 is an opportunity to fight real disillusion with video game disillusion. Super Mario Bros. 2 is both internally and externally, meta-narratively and pro-narratively, what it eats and what it ecrements, a confused identity. The Shy Guy's masks are practical at the fundamental most basic level. They hide his face, with the clone equivalent wide o mouth expression as the most common enemy. They represent the true neutral. In contrast, Bezo's mask serve pure practicality, without a mouth hole it protects his flying head from wind. A ninji's mask is a lifestyle. Black and white are the purest color contrast. Sniffits wear war masks, not unlike a western front gas mask that shoots stuff. Phanto is a living, sentient contradiction. Red crimson to represent his loyalty, courage, and heroism, and white to signify his evil, hypocritical ways. Phanto is like Hannibal Lecter. He will kill you. He will rip your still-beating heart out. Phanto smells your pulse. You're on life support, and Phanto is cutting the cord. And he does it all with a perpetual smile. Super Mario Bros. 2 is the Zelda Majora's Mask of Super Mario Bros. Does Zelda Majora's Mask have 303 masked enemies? Let's talk about antithetical masks. Overshadowing any Yarby conversation about Birdo is the topic of gender. 
i.e. is Birdo a Glen or a Glenda? Whatever, the instruction manual claims it's Birdetta. It's the only noteworthy potentially trans figure in any Nintendo universe that I can think of. The thing creates eggs, that's probably the most feminine thing I can think of. Is Birdo supposed to be one singular character, or rather, a race of people? The character appears precisely 17 times. Only four of those encounters feature the iconic pink shade we know them for. The manual labels our friend Astro, specifies that this is indeed a man who believes he is a girl that shoots eggs from his mouth. Bowser is an obvious reincarnation of Bowser. Because wordplay. Triclyde in the Game Boy Advance version likes to talk a lot of shit. Step right up. If you're ready to get toasted. Fry Guy. Fry Guy is actually four kids in a trench coat. Wart is an unashamed man-child, collecting killer phantom masks. He controls the means of Subcon's vegetable production, which is, in isolation, the one and only item that will do the job. In Super Mario Bros. 2, you perform jumps, runs, throws, moving a cornucopia of places. They actually follow sort of a V-shaped pattern. World 1 mirrors, in a way, World 7. 2 and 6 are a couple of sand dormitories, 3 and 6 are both spent mostly inside caverns, saving World 4 as a special little unicorn. Only 4-2 has whales, and like Karibo's shoe in Mario 3, it is one of the first things I think of when I hear the phrase, Mario 2. I am an only child. When I was small, I used to dream about having a little brother to play Super Mario with. My parents hated each other, so that was never a thing that would happen. One day, an uncle of mine was babysitting me, and we were locked out of his second story apartment. To this day, the coolest thing I have ever seen in my entire life was him running up the wall and pulling himself into an open window. Earlier that same day, I was playing Super Mario Bros. 2. He asked if he could join me, to which I said, no, idiot, this game is one player. I never thought about it until this very moment. But why is this game one player? It's the only one with distinct characters in which having two players would actually make sense. Have you ever wondered what's inside the door? I don't even have to show you. Making YouTube videos, for me anyway, is a very lonely process. I play a game alone, I write words down, speak into an overpriced microphone and then arrange everything on my computer. Nobody else sees it. As I'm speaking this very moment, nobody can hear me. Yet the bond between you the watcher and me the speaker is so fortiful that I don't even have to show you the door when I say, have you ever wondered what is inside the door? I used to imagine that on the other side was the Mushroom Kingdom, and that if I could just go inside I would appear at the end of the original Super Mario Brothers. Maybe you would end up in our Brooklyn. If you want the technical answer, I found a YouTube video where somebody makes the door accessible using a ROM editor. It leads to a Minus World-esque filled glitch land. If you read the opening crawl, you'd know that presumably Mario's mind lays on the other side of that door. It can be whatever he wants it to be. Doors are weird in Super Mario Bros. 2. Most stages conclude with you, the player, walking into a bird's gaping mouth. The singular most important element the original Super Mario Bros. gifted to the world of video game design are the physics and all the thought that went into them. The acceleration of Mario's run, the controllable nature of his jump, 
the friction of his turnaround. I cannot think of any prior game to have frames of animation dedicated to a character turning around specifically when they are already running. I can easily imagine making the perfect character control taking as long to develop as the rest of the game combined. It's not amazing that Super Mario Bros. 2 has four playable characters, but it is amazing that they created four different sets of physics for them. The most impressive factor might just be how well all four are balanced. Firstly, you will probably notice the different jumps. With Toad having the lowest, Mario jumping a little higher, Peach and Luigi being huge outliers. Peach has a truanted jump arc, she moves in a straight line. I often hear that she floats or glides, but she actually doesn't even jump the furthest. Luigi, with a full head of steam, actually jumps further. Each character has their own strengths and weaknesses. Peach floats, making precise platforming the easiest. Toad is fastest, which has obvious advantages, but he can't jump nearly as well. Luigi has the best jumping ability, but he's slow and twitchy, making landing in tight quarters a hassle. These three characters all have unique disadvantages and payoffs, and when you don't want to choose, Mario has a little bit of everything. After beating the game with all four characters, Mario might actually be my favorite. Oftentimes, Princess Peach is considered overpowered. I am not a golf expert. The only time I've ever swung a golf club in my life is when I was 12 years old at a family gathering. A distant relative became aware of the fact that I'd never swung a golf club. He had a set of youth-sized clubs in his trunk that would normally be used by his daughter. At 12 years old, I was already well over 6 feet tall. Trying to hit a golf ball as an over 6 feet tall 12 year old using youth sized clubs meant for a small girl is akin to fighting Birdo on a moving conveyor belt with Princess Peach. His daughter wouldn't stick with golf much longer. Like how players of Princess Peach don't get far enough into the game to realize that she is horrible in late game boss fights. Princess Peach is not overpowered, in fact, she's my least favorite. Isn't it a little hilarious the first time you jump onto an enemy and it doesn't die? You just awkwardly receive a piggyback ride. Any remarkable game takes fun little quirks like this and cleverly runs as far as they possibly can with them. In 1-2, only the second level of the game requires you to ride this magic carpet and the theme comes back a few more times in 4-2, 4-3, 6-2, and 7-1. It presents the riding things to get across a gap early so it can come back in more complex ways later on. Here's 4-2. It's not a pit and you need to ride this cannon. One of the few non-boss fight respawning birdos, innocuously placed at the start of 4-3, shoots eggs that when ridden lead to the rest of the stage. 5-3 places a hidden warp on the conclusion of a ride. 6-2 ramps up the challenge by making you take your ride, avoiding obstacles the entire length of the stage. And finally, 7-1 uses it in a maze-like setting where you need to use a bird's height to travel left and clear this tall pillar. Making little fun things that your game has, the joy of riding an enemy, into the level brings me much glee. And that's before you even consider that you can throw things as well. Throwing things is almost as fun as riding things. Every boss fight in this game requires you to throw Thing A at Thing B. Aside from the obvious combat utilities, Super Mario Bros. 2 has a surprising amount of very light puzzle solving. 3-2 is half Pitfall-esque dual layer platforming, half bomb riddles, the final stage has multiple twists and turns, and if you're not careful, it will appear to loop in on itself. Another innovation that could possibly be taken for granted is the ability to move in multiple directions. Super Mario Bros. 2 has many vertically oriented passages. My favorite examples involve digging through the sand, with 2-3 possibly being the most primo representation. I love these parts because they combine two of this game's design adjectives, the lifting of objects and the vertical design, after a lengthy opening side-scrolling desert section where you can actually go left to get a little secret. You enter a door and descend into the largest gathering of phantom masks in the game so far. 
Then you dig and dig and dig and come to an even larger gathering of cloaked faces. It's a marriage not only of the two at the time unique to this game's design elements, but a marriage of text and subtext. With 25 masks, a desert backdrop, a vertically falling section, and a sand digging section, this mini subset of 2-3 is a micro personification of the entire work as a whole. If Super Mario Bros. 2 were the Last Supper, this segment would be Jesus' forlorn expression. If it were Citizen Kane, it would be his obituary. If it were an Oreo, it would be the creamy filling. If it were Super Mario Bros. 1, which it almost is, it would be the first stage. In addition to the tried and true Mario and Super Mario system, there is a health bar. You shatter magical beakers to search for mushrooms, which add to your meter. Other power-ups include a Mario Bros. POW block, a Koopa shell, and cherries, which spawn the invincibility star. Super Mario Bros. 2 use of environmental hazards was an original design element for the time. The quicksand, for instance, is clever because it doesn't suck you up right away. It just slows you down and forces you to jump a lot, becoming a larger target for snakes and careening balls. Ice is used exclusively as a slippery lubricant, forcing you to slide repeatedly into the enemy. Mushroom blocks serve as the sole weapon against bosses like Fry Guy and Triclide. The enemies crescendo in challenges from shy guys that walk back and forth to ninjas that leap and chase you down, and phantos which are out for blood. Some projectiles can't be jumped on, phantos and monstros cannot be felled. There's a lot to deal with in this game. Luckily, each new screen is a checkpoint. Unluckily, you are only granted three lives and two continues. Well, I fired off every one of my hypothetical shots about Super Mario Bros. 2, and my last one is about something that I love. Super Mario Bros. 2 is one of the last bastions of horizontal wrapping gameplay. The feature is as old as anything else. The oldest example I can think of dates back to 1975's Jet Fighter. It was used more famously in games like Asteroid, Joust, Pac-Man, and bringing this full circle. Mario Brothers. In closing, I'm going to say that I tried something different with this game. I really wanted to put something under the magnifying glass and really just look at it. It's been a long time since I did something like that, and I feel like I've gotten a lot better at just making videos in general since then. Who knows, I might make more of these if I feel like it. If the inspiration strikes, you know? <sighs> Alright, that was a wrap.